Okay, so this is a second item in the new code. Uh, behavior analysts take on only a volume of supervisory activity commensurate with ability. This is what uh, Michael and I did our role play about. Um, that's too many. <laughs> Something more like that might be manageable. Two, three, four, five. I don't know if anybody can do more than five unless you were full-time nothing but but uh, not too many supervisors are. They usually have their own caseload, some administrative duties, and then they pick up some of this stuff. Um, the key phrase in 5.02 is ability to be effective. Here's another term, like defined competence, which is not defined. Um, ability to be effective sounds like it would be what? How would you know if you were effective? If, if there was change, if there was change in your supervisees, if they, if you took some data, and they were here, and after a while you could see they were there and they were there and they were there, but if they were going the other direction, then you'd assume either you're a really bad supervisor or you got too many people. So there would have to be almost like an, an audit, like a behavioral audit, to figure out what are we doing here. Uh, is it the case that you're not a good supervisor, or what if we lightened your load? Could you do a better job? And uh, the, the, this is, uh, right now, this is the generic term, <laughs> ability to be effective. Um, and uh, it depends on data on the supervisees. And right now, most supervisors have no data on their supervisees. So they could say, oh, they're doing pretty good or really good or whatever. But in terms of actual data, they don't know that. That's another area that we need to get filled with some research is how do you evaluate that so you can tell. Some, here's some examples to just to kind of get you, a, uh, you know, run the numbers to see if any of it makes sense. Uh, Full-time BCBA, so 40 hours a week, has her own caseload, works 15 hours a week as a supervisor, <coughs> has 10 supervisees. If you spent one hour per week minimum per supervisee, and one hour per week group meeting with all of them. That gives you 11 hours plus some time for travel. Now, uh, paperwork and all that kind of stuff. That assumes that one hour a week <coughs> per supervisee would be enough and that one hour group meeting would be enough. But that, both of those depend on the dependent variable. And the dependent variable is how are the supervisees doing? So this, this has got to be, this is gonna have to be fixed in order for 5.02 to work uh, people are going to have to develop uh, uh, data collection systems. I attended a, a workshop at um, ABBA a year ago, uh, and the title was um, Solving Your Problems as a Supervisor. And I thought, man, I want to learn about this. I want to go to this. And, and ABBA apparently thought this was a hot topic because they put it in this giant room, and there are about 10 of us sitting in the front row. <coughs> Uh, listening to the speaker intently, and she starts off, this perky lady starts, gets up there, and she says, uh, I think I've got all the answers to all your supervision problems, and I'm ready to go. Man, I'm getting ready to write all this down, because I'm working with Ulema on this research project. And she goes, spreadsheets. That's the answer, spreadsheets. And the, the, the whole session, from then till about the last 10 minutes, had to do with this spreadsheet formula that she had to keep track of basically what she was doing. So we got down to the end, and I could see that she was running out of time. It didn't look like she was going to talk about my favorite topic, so I put my hand up and I said, so do you actually observe these people? And she goes, well, no. This is about spreadsheets. So I don't know exactly how she wound up there, but it, it didn't have anything to do with my definition of what this is. Um, so here's just some rough ideas. Uh, this is not well worked out. Outcome measures for effectiveness. You have several, let's say you have five supervisees. Uh, they all, you have time to, that everybody gets one-on-one -on -one observations uh, and feedback sessions. If you have time to do all that, that could be one measure, but it's very rough. Uh, 
and uh, it, it doesn't really show you what they actually did, but at least it showed that you could meet with people. And you can see that scheduling is a big issue here. No supervise, supervisees have any complaints lodged against them. Again, it's a very gross measure. If, uh, if people are complaining, their teacher is complaining or the parents are complaining about your supervisees, you're obviously doing something wrong because you're responsible for that. You can't just put it on them. You could have a satisfaction survey of the supervisees where you have somebody else administer this uh, and it's anonymous, but you ask the supervisees some questions about their supervision. What did you think about your supervisor? And that information goes to somebody else, they compile it and then they bring that to you. Uh, but again, that's a soft measure. It's just a kind of a, a, a rating uh, and it's just more verbal behavior because it's not actually direct observation. Now we're getting into something good. Data on client progress, which would be rated uh, at or above uh, where you'd expect them to be. Now what this means is the trainee is working on a defined task. The defined task can be measured and it can be measured repeatedly and you can graph it and you can look at it. That means you have to figure out some way to capture client behavior, whatever the, whatever the dependent variable is. You've got to be able to capture that measure and so on. It begins to look like a research project, which it is, and which is where this whole thing is headed, I think. We, we need to have that or we don't know. If everything else looked good all the way up to here and you didn't have client progress, it's not definitive yet. We don't know yet. Now here's some things that might affect the uh, this standard formula. Status of the supervisee. Uh, a brand new, very green person is gonna take more time. A person who's more experienced, really got their act together, working on just a few things, probably a little less time. Uh, some supervisees <coughs> are very intent, very responsible. They wanna get everything right. Some are, well, whatever, I'll get there eventually. So you, that's one variable. Uh, the difficulty of the case that they're working on, that's a really key part of this whole thing is uh, how difficult is the case. If your supervisee is kind of shaky and they have a tough case, you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. Supervisee is shaky, but they have an easy case, won't take so much time. But so you can begin to see what the management issues are here. And as a supervisor, you've got to weigh all of these things. I'm thinking that we need the research and maybe Data Finch could develop this. We need a dashboard for supervisors. So you pick up your dash, dashboard would pop out on your screen every morning when you, when you got up and it would be, I don't know, columns of data for each of your supervisor, supervisees and it would show you where their status was and then you would allocate your time and your resources based on what the dashboard shows you. Um, that's very common in business uh, now to have uh, uh, roll-up measures like that. A supervisee is preparing for the BCA, BCBA exam. They're going to probably take more time. They have more questions. Whatever time is required, or where does the one hour, hour and a half, two hours come in? Because if you have somebody that's pretty shaky, like you're talking about, and they're not, <clears throat> an hour's not enough. Next week, an hour's not enough. Where, where do, you, where, where's kind of the the line or whatever between I'm doing the part that I'm supposed to do to supervise and it's not effective at that level, yep. and this is I'm retraining this person to do things they should have learned in grad school. Well, that might be the case. And if you remember, uh, uh, taking on a supervisee now requires a contract between you and them uh, where you're going to specify for them, here's what your supervision experience is going to look like, here's what you can expect from me, and this is what I expect from you. So theoretically, you could get in and discover that this, uh, 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 this supervisee is just a sinkhole of your time 
and you know you might have to bring them back in and say you know look according to the contract I was willing to spend X amount of time this is taking way more time you're fired you have to do Donald Trump on him um, I don't know if you've heard of him he's running for president <coughs> um, but uh, the the number is a fictional average it's a number that a bunch of people sitting around the table agreed to well that sounds about right three hours no that's not gonna work an hour no that'll never work how about two can we sell two can you buy two uh, I don't think people are gonna how about an hour and a half okay sold I think that's probably you know how these things are done it's like a faculty meeting you know you got to decide how many publications do you have to have to be promoted how about 20 well uh, how about 10? No, you got to be kidding. All right, 15. 15 is everybody? 15. It's like that. It's like one of those decisions. Uh, I think ultimately, if, if people can get into this and start doing research on it, we'll begin to have some sense of it. And the question that was asked earlier fits with this one, which is how do you size up a trainee? If you had some way, some kind of routine you could run them through, and have some some sense of this person's really needy. I, I could easily spend, see spending three or four hours a week on this person, versus you know we did the assessment on them. They're pretty pretty ready to go. Very little supervision is needed. Um, uh, so that's another piece. You can begin to see all the pieces that are needed, and most of them are missing. There are zeros out there now. My supervisor has a full caseload of clients. She teaches part-time, has six second-year students. Uh, we've met, none of us feels like we're getting adequate supervision. What recourse do the students have? Well, they, they're gonna have to go to, they're gonna have to go to their supervisor's supervisor, probably. They have to talk to the person first, because that's the recommended procedure and then they're going to have to go to somebody else. Um, and it's going to be very touchy. Um, it's, to a certain extent, this, uh, when this all starts in January, it's sort of like a big experiment that we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, it could be very tense between people. Um, I could see, in terms of uh, training, I don't know if this is the kind of training you guys develop at DataFinch or not, but I could see videotapes out there that show people how to talk to your supervisor. Uh, I think stuff like that would be useful, sort of like what we did, except better. Um, delegation. Super behavior analysts delegate to their supervisees only those responsibility that such persons can reasonably be expected, I don't know why this all messed up like this, to perform competently, ethically, safely. Uh, again, there's a lot of subjectivity there. Uh, what does competent mean? Ethics, we sort of know. Safety, we sort of know that, but not always. Um, but uh, what, what this means is you have to size the person up and you have to include in your contract all of these elements uh, that tells the person what they're responsible for. And if they don't have the skills, uh, you've got to provide conditions for the acquisition of those skills. or you're going to say, I'm sorry, I can't be your supervisor anymore. So uh, your, your scenario that you were working out, Michael, is correct. If uh, somebody is really not ready for this, you're going to have to figure out how do I scale it down, which is exactly what you do with the behavior plan. You know, you say uh, the kid will be able to, to speak uh, six word sentences uh, by the end of the semester. And you get out to the end of the semester and he's doing three word sentences you're going to have to scale back because uh, you're way behind. And the same thing's going to go, all those same skills are going to apply to supervisees. Annie's a BCBA working in a new center that boasts two BCBAs, several BCABAs, enough room for 30 children, state-of-the-art environment. One client, Gloria, has been at the center for several months. She's made some good progress, still largely nonverbal. She's able to ask for a few things, uses electronic PECs. The parents started discussing with BCBA that Gloria makes vocal sounds that they find annoying. They want to know if there's anything can be done about it. Annie recommends a procedure she knows has become popular in the research 
but she's never used it, called RIRD, Response Interruption and Redirection. Anybody heard about that? You guys know about that? She's excited, so she has an answer uh, to this problem for these parents, so she implements RIRD right away for her team of therapists. Can you see her first mistake? She doesn't know what it is. She's never actually done it. She's just heard about it. When the other BCBA in the program is on the floor and sees the RIRD implemented, she notices the staff seem to be applying the procedure differently. Some are applying it to vocalizations that seem appropriate. <clears throat> Others are only applying it to vocals that are repetitive or non-functional. When the BCBA asks the direct service staff about the program, two of the four instructors on Gloria's team call it vocal imitation program but do not seem to understand the purpose of it. Lastly, the data seems to show that all of Gloria's vocal mans and other vocal behaviors have decreased since the onset of RIRD. Simple case of uh, delegating something that you don't know anything about. So under the new code, you could be reported for that. When the BCBA asks Annie what the research says on using RIRD on early vocal learners, she goes, I don't know. I haven't read it. So uh, theoretically, the new code will uh, point that out to people, and they will be much more careful about what they do. Designing effective supervision and training. Behavior analysts assure, ensure that supervision trainings are behavior analytic in content, effective, ethically designed, meet the requirements of licensure, certification, other defined goals. Um, this is pretty simple. Basically, you, you don't implement things that have nothing to do with uh, behavior analysis. Can I teach yoga or meditation? It helps people relax. I've actually gotten that kind of a question. Uh, I was a yoga teacher and then I heard about behavior analysis and now I do yoga uh, for relaxation, but I do behavior analysis. Can I implement this with my kids? So I write back, is there research on that? They write back, no. It's like a little one of those little chats you go through. No. Well, then I think you know the answer to that. Uh, it's not a behavior analytic procedure. I'm glad, that, I'm glad that it helps you relax, but uh, it makes me nervous. Uh, Ryan has been engaging in high frequency of hair pulling. Uh, Katie and BCBA tells the staff to start using an ABC narrative recording. After several weeks, the other BCBA and the staff notice that their staff are reactively giving this child messages, massages, excuse me, massages to the head and hands as an intervention for hair pulling. So she looks over the data and sees that the frequency of the problem behavior does not seem to be decreasing. The graph shows, if anything, the frequency of hair pulling seems to have increased since the start of the intervention, which was several weeks ago. The parents have approached the center to say that the behaviors also seem to be occurring at the school that Ryan attends half day and the teachers are there complaining about it, especially because he's now done it to other children in the class. Let me just say, that's not an actual picture of the kid doing this. That's a, somebody else's kid that put this on the web. I don't know why people do that, but uh, thank you. Uh, when the other BCBA approaches Katie about this, she replies that she is sure the intervention is working because she's not seen as much hair pulling during her observations of him, and the staff are not complaining about it as much. Uh, so, you know, effective supervision is, can't be allowed to drift to the point that it's all uh, soft measures like that. The people are going to have to come up with hard measures. Government Center, where I work, they decided to spend a lot of money on spreading the practice of mindfulness. Anybody heard of mindfulness? A couple people. Uh, th mindfulness through the staff. I have nothing against mindfulness, per se, as a way for people to try and feel calmer or better about themselves or in general. The person they have been working with is a BCBAD and a big name in mindfulness and specifically with people caring for individuals with destructive behavior as a way to reduce problem behavior uh, and aggression in these individuals. To be sure, I do have a problem with the fact that no money is being spent on educating the frontline workers in behavioral interventions and instead upwards of 100K has been spent on mindfulness to date.
this is this actually uh, this question came from Canada. People in Canada have been there a few times. People in Canada are very nice, and the idea of confronting somebody. They're not too sharp about that. Um, and uh, this is a government program, so this isn't a one BCBA. This government, somebody in the government came up with this idea, came up with the money, found this BCBA D who is taking the money for doing this. Anybody see any violation of 5.04 there? As far as I know, it's not. It doesn't come out of our tradition. It doesn't operate on any of the basic principles of behavior that we uh, that we operate on. Um, I actually found out who this BCBAD was, contacted the person, and uh, said, uh, <laughs> and I, I just said, so do you have some research on this? Uh, and he said, oh yes, there's lots of research on it. I said, really? I'd like to see it. So he sent it to me. Well, there's good research and there's everything else. So you've got JABA and then you've got all these other publications that will take an article because they're desperate, but it doesn't mean they have good selection of methodology. So I looked through the articles and they were all, I'd say, B and C tier journals. Uh, so I wrote them back and said, I think there's a problem with the methodology here. And I kind of listed a few things. We had one conversation on the phone where he said, oh no, it's all fine. And um, that's pretty much where that ended. Uh, all right, 5.05, .05, communication of supervision conditions. This is where you have to have a contract with your supervisees. I was assigned to a new case over the phone, told that the school to go to, classroom, what time, I'll send you the program uh, as an email attachment. The email never arrived, I left a voicemail, and uh, this all sounds familiar, I'm sure. Uh, go, just go in and introduce yourself to the teacher. Teacher points to a, a boy in the back row, had his head on his desk, was sobbing. I really didn't know what to do. I just sat next to him, tried to provide some comfort. So, I mean, that's just a gross mismanagement of, uh, of the concept of uh, meeting supervision requirements. Providing feedback to supervisees. Behavior analysts design and reinforcement assessments in a way that improves supervisee performance. Remember that was part of my initial definition of this whole thing is uh, supervision has to have uh, some kind of an outcome uh, connected with it. Behavior analysts this is from the code, of course. Behavior analysts provide documented, timely feedback regarding the performance of a supervisee on an ongoing basis. This is also mentioned in 10.05 uh, in the standards. So here's what's not defined here. Uh, feedback and reinforcement systems. Systems is not defined. We definitely need that. Timely is not defined. Ongoing basis is not defined. So these are terms that we work with, terms that we use to get started. But eventually, we're going to figure out what timely is. Uh, you know, as, as research accumulates, uh, hopefully we'll begin to know what that is. Uh, and the whole idea of reinforcement systems uh, has to come into play. Wednesday, I met with an individual to supervise. She submitted a time log detailing a variety of field work for a two-week period. Some of the activities included reading a variety of texts. When questioned about a particular text listed in the time log, it became very apparent to me that she did not do the 4.5 hours of reading that was documented for the particular test. We discussed this in a calm, professional manner. She displayed outward signs of panic when she realized that she was caught falsifying her field work time log. After taking the rest of the day to think about it, she informed me that she plans to find another BCBA to provide the remainder of her supervision. 
I'm comfortable with her with terminating our supervision contract in this instance. However, I have several concerns related to my ethical obligations. I feel I should report the supervisee's behavior to someone, but I'm unsure if that is appropriate in the supervisory role. You stop right there. How many th people think that that's part of your supervisory role? Anybody? A couple, three, four people? Some people are not sure. If you ask me, I say yes. This is a supervisee. They work under your control to a certain extent. If they violate the code, you talk to them about it. That's not going to be fixed. You report them. And starting in January 1, somebody from the board or one of the uh, volunteers working as a coach for the board uh, will contact this person and they'll know, you know, tag your it. puts not only supervisees in an awkward position about reporting their supervisor, but report, uh, supervisors in an awkward position about reporting their supervisee. Behavior analysts uh, design systems for obtaining ongoing evaluation of their own supervision activities. This one, I think, is really going to be uh, curious to people. I don't think they're going to know how to do this. Uh, you have to come up with a way of evaluating your own supervision activity uh, and it has to meet all those previous requirements so presumably you can't do this unless you have specified to your trainees exactly what they're supposed to do which means your contract is pretty precise it means you've taken some data it means you've graphed it you've looked at the trend lines you see all the stuff that's going to be involved this is going to be difficult for some people um, especially this part that little line, that thing should be moved over a little bit, but specifically the systems part of this. Um, anybody have a good idea what a system is? You know what a behavior plan is, but what's a system? What's a, a system for obtaining ongoing evaluation? <coughs> Set of guidelines. Set of guidelines. Rules. Let's stop right there for a second and think of the last time you actually saw a system at work. What did it look like? Me too. I, <laughs> I struggled with that too. Because ordinarily systems are invisible because they're deep inside an organization and you can't actually see them. And then I was coming back from somewhere, and I was here at the Atlanta airport. I spent a lot of time at the Atlanta airport. Mm -hmm. And I was, they have nice big windows like these, and I was standing there and I was watching a plane come in, and there was a guy indicating to how to land the plane, and boy, quick, like a bunch of ants, all these other little trucks and stuff came up to unload these and put the food on and clean this and change this. And I realized, ah, that's a system. That's a system. It's a bunch of pieces that all have to come together in order for people to get out on time. That's a system. Uh, I was given a workshop recently and I asked the same question. Anybody seen a system? And uh, uh, one person said, baseball. You can sit in this stadium and watch the system. It all has to work. You have players from both teams and you've got umpires and you've got rules, guidelines, like what you're talking about. And you can actually see it all kind of comes together in an entertaining, competitive sort of a way. Other than that, it's hard to see a system. If you've ever built a token economy, you've built a system. It has to look something like that. But most behavior analysts don't have enough experience with systems, so this is going to be hard for them. I've got a couple more things to say about that, uh, but uh, give you some idea. So this is uh, one way of looking at a system uh, where you analyze, you have ideas, you develop, you execute and you assess. So the assessment part is, did it all work? Was the analysis correct? Was it developed properly? Was it executed properly? So that's one way to kind of think about uh, a system. Here's, here's a rough idea that I've just recently come up with as a system for us, for behavior analysts and what we do. So. Uh, it starts with an initial meeting between the supervisor and the supervisee and out of that comes a contract 
and then an assessment. Uh, those two things are maybe the other way around. Maybe the assessment first, then the contract. But you'll get the rough idea here. Now you get to the scheduling. And that comes pretty early in this whole uh, system is when are you doing what you're going to be doing that I can watch you? So my schedule has to match your schedule. <coughs> then I have to do some direct observations. And during those direct observations, I have to do uh, data collection. So somewhere in here, I should have had another stream which had to do with the, the development of a data collection system. You've observed, you've collected the data. Now you've got to set priorities. Now we get to the actual guts of the supervision, which is the shaping part, the behavior management part. I like to think of it as shaping uh, and shaping using uh, behavior skills training. That's sort of our standard package for the field. That would be an opportunity, and this is going to complete the circle, as you can see, and, and you'll go around it several times. Depending upon where you are with your supervisee, that might be a good time to evaluate the supervisor. Uh, did, if, for example, the, you're doing the shaping. Is the supervisee's behavior changing? Uh, it might also be an evaluation of um, uh, what did you think of your supervisor, if that comes up. Uh, then you're going to do your follow-up observations, and you may determine that the goals have been met, that the supervisee is done, in which case, uh, if, the, if it's a BCABA, you're into maintenance mode. If it's a BC, if it's a trainee, uh, BCBA trainee, uh, then the supervision may be complete at that point. Uh, then you're going to go to your next uh, priorities, and then next to an assessment. Again, you're going to go back and complete that again. So the system consists of a complete s set of steps that have to be done. They've got to be done in a certain order. This is very rough in terms of uh, how that might work. Uh, if you were thinking of it as like an old an old time watch with gears, each each one of these would have a set of gears out here that drives this, a set of gears that drives this, and each one of those. So then it would look much more complicated in that regard. Five point oh seven, evaluating the effects of supervision. Uh, do, during a direct observation, uh, we recommend uh, videotape. Dennis, oh. You, you know, John, I'm thinking about um, our, our work that I came in at the tail end of in, in Thomasville, Georgia, and and what do we call it? Behavior systems management, right? Yeah. And the sort of glue that held that all together and made it work is something you have hit on a couple of times here, and that was client progress and teacher promotions were contingent on the progress of their clients right. year in and year out. Right. And uh, I was sort of thinking about how the code of ethics or our new code that's, that's uh, coming up here um, and the way that you're presenting this today, it all feels like negative reinforcement, right? Where we want to avoid getting nailed by that code to do all the right stuff. Now, sure. I think all the positive reinforcement is coming in that you know, the process on yeah. a slide or two back. Um, and it's inherent in a lot of those processes. But I, I don't know. I thought I'd perhaps yeah. get you to comment on that. I think in general, the code uh, is written as a, a big negative reinforcer. Avoid getting punished by doing these things. It doesn't have any reinforcers built in. So if you follow the code, you don't get, you know, a raise. You don't get a little button that you can put on, you know, I've worked for Walmart for five years or there's nothing, nothing. We don't have anything like that. Uh, and in general, uh, licensing codes for other professions are written in the same way. It, the expectation is that you're going to do everything right, and if you step over the line, you're going to get nailed. Uh, so that the positive reinforcement that would come from this is going to have to be built into an organization. A, a, supervi a, a person who's a, a CEO, manager of a company, would have to build in all the reinforcers for doing that right.
So here's some ways that you could evaluate supervision. Uh, you could evaluate client performance, evaluate uh, feedback from a colleague. Uh, I've already mentioned the Uber supervisor. Uh, could, uh, you could have it worked out so that each, superv that each supervisor had a supervisor. This is the Uber that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and, and a big enough organization could have somebody or more than one person that did that. Theoretically, you could also have some kind of peer review supervisor, so the supervisors review each other's work. That might get to be sticky, um, but it could be tried, and it would be interesting to see what that would look like. So here's a model of what this might look like. There's the therapist and her client, and <laughs> there's our supervisor who is going to evaluate the trainee performance using some kind of a checklist. Now the trainee might be given an opportunity on a regular basis to evaluate the quality of uh, the supervision that they get. Um, I think that's, that's going to be built into any system. So there you've got, you've got a small piece of the system. Supervisor can take self-monitoring data. How, did I meet? Uh, I, I, during the last uh, three months, uh, I scheduled 30 meetings with my supervisees. How many did I meet? Well, I met all 30 of them. Okay, so I do <coughs> well on that. Uh, how well did my supervisees do on their objectives? There would be another measure. A really good measure is an evaluation of client performance. That turns out to be tricky. We've been messing with this for a while. And in the work that we've got, we don't have that quite worked out uh, because the tasks change from time to time. And uh, so it doesn't give you a nice standard measure. But. And then there you go. That's the Uber supervisor who does this. So in the research that we're doing, this is the target, is the supervisor. We need these people so we have something to measure in terms of supervisor performance. And on the pilot data, Ulima, my, my graduate student, doctoral student, she provided the role of the Uber uh, in, the, in the pilot phase. And when we get to the next phase, there will be uh, a couple of other people, uh, not her, who would be trained to be in that particular role. All right, I think we can do this. We might run over a little bit, Kobe, but I'll do the best I can. All right, so this last piece, I've been alluding to this uh, work that I've been doing with uh, Ulema. It just reminded me, um, uh, tech guys in the back, I do have another video clip I'm gonna show coming up. All right, so, um, you need data on trainees and supervisees. You're going to need some kind of a data sheet. And the data sheet has to, to uh, include everything that you can observe in whatever it is. We chose DTT as a standard type of task for uh, uh, therapists to do. There's lots of other things they do. Many of them were very hard to, me to measure. So we ended up with this. So, uh, and we tested. Lots of different categories. We ran those by people. I mean, it, it gets to be complicated. We're going to evaluate supervisee performance. So part of the system is a data sheet. And you're going to be looking at different sessions. Uh, uh, with each of the categories, you have to determine, uh, is it going to be 10-second uh, intervals, one-minute intervals? All that's got to be worked out. Uh, you have to have reliability checks. Uh, this down here is just this kind of a sample of what uh, this is pretty good reliability checks down here we didn't we didn't start with that we started with 60 70 percent we had to revise revise till we got there there's a, um, a therapist with a child there's the supervisor. So the supervisor is watching the therapist. To me, 
that's what supervision looks like. <coughs> Therapist, a client, and a supervisor uh, uh, with a data sheet ready to take data. That's the person who's the target of all of this stuff. So you can see it all kind of comes in levels. So you've got to start with some baseline data uh, before, before the supervisor starts shaping on the supervisee. You've got to have data on the supervisee and the supervisor. How did the supervisor do before the Uber supervisor started giving him or her feedback on how to be a supervisor? So this is a data sheet of supervisor performance. Uh, it took a long time to work this out. We looked at a lot of videotapes before we figured out what appear to be the right steps for a uh, supervisor to go through. Um, identified and document the relevant tra trainer, trainee behaviors. Prioritize steps. Prompted note taking. That was one thing we discovered right off the bat. You've got a, tra a trainee. Uh, We've got a videotape of them working with the client. The supervisor comes in and says, okay, we need to talk about what you did. You show them the tape. They look at the tape and they go, uh-huh. And you move on to something else. And they go, uh-huh. They're not taking data. They're not writing anything down. And I asked Ulema, how could you do that? How could you receive all that feedback and somehow remember it and apply it without writing it down? So we just said, okay, well, we'll put that on the list. As you're a supervisor, you have to prompt somebody, get out your notepad, you're going to be taking some notes. And the curious thing is the students, these were obviously students, they'd go, oh, like class. <laughs> yeah, this is sort of a class. It's sort of what it is. Um, coaching is part of it. Opportunities for role play, uh, providing positive reinforcement, prompting relevant skills, and so on. We've played with a lot of that until we could come up with anything that was reliable. So here's a working definition then of uh, behavioral supervision. Not supervision, behavioral supervision. I think it's really shaping. If you're a supervisor, really what you are is an expert shaper. And that's our term. We know what shaping is. So being a supervisor means you're an expert at shaping. Initially, probably where we're going to be at is it's going to be measured by topography. Ultimately, it's going to have to be measured by outcome. So you'll be known as a good supervisor based on how well your supervisees did. Now, uh, I came up with this, I don't know, I think my brain was working overtime and I woke up in the middle of the night and it was like, ah, that's what it is. Ah, I got it. And I keep my phone right by the bed and I send myself emails in the middle of the night. So when I wake up, I go, hey, what's this? Oh, oh that's how, who wrote that? That's pretty good. Um, and it occurred to me that you can't just define supervision as shaping. You have to define it in terms of something more concrete than that. So I just proposed, uh, let's talk about the definition of one hour of supervision. One hour of supervision proposal consists of 30 minutes of direct observation, followed by 10 minutes of analyzing the data, because you're going to have a lot of data, and you have to do all that, followed by 20 minutes of expert shaping using behavioral skills training. And if you did that, following the uh, BACB code minimums of uh, what is required, you'd end up saying, well, I know, what's, I know what one hour of supervision, behavioral supervision looks like. It looks like something like this. Now, these numbers might change. This might be 20 minutes and this might be 30, depending upon the nature of the, the supervisee. But it's got to have at least three, three parts. There has to be a time of direct observation. Now, to answer that earlier question, that direct observation could be remote. I think for, for the time being, until we know more about it, we could say there are some circumstances which uh, this might be a 30-minute vi videotape that the person observes. This is really key, though. I looked at the tape. What did I see? So then you have to take some notes 
on what you saw, and you have to prioritize what you had. And that's probably the same data sheet. And then some shaping. And this is the part we're looking at, which is how do you get supervisors to do a better job of behavior shaping so that it's not just talking to people, but it's actual BST. Uh, and so we're looking at tapes, trying to analyze what that looks like. So the question is, the, the fundamental question for our field is how do we train BCBAs to become supervisors? Right now we have kind of a superficial definition. It's defined in terms of uh, hours, eight hours plus one. So you, theoretically you could uh, not even pay very close attention during those eight hours. If you can pass a test over it, you're a supervisor. Uh, so we send people off to take eight hours of training. We've refined this a while. We think that we've got 10, what amount to 10 essential skills for a supervisor. And they look like that. I've already shown you this once, but this kind of puts them together in one uh, list, undistracted. Uh, I, I suspect that people who get into this will make up their own uh, operational definitions. And that's fine. Uh, this is a good time for people to get in there and try uh, different uh, skills and so on. That's what a data sheet looks like. You can see there's one where we got only 80% reliability on that one. We train BCBAs to become supervisors the way, the same way that they train supervisees. And it's the same way that supervisees train their clients. So it's this scaffolding sort of system, but the principles are exactly the same. There's nothing different. You don't have to learn a bunch of new principles. The principles are all there. Uh, it's just the way that they apply this. So this is the video clip. Can I go ahead and play it? Oh, before I start the tape. So you see what you're doing. This is Ulema, the Uber. This is a supervisor. This is her looking at her supervisee, and they're both looking at a tape of him with the client. So it's like one of those abstract things of somebody standing in front of a mirror, and you can see mirror and mirror and mirror. But that's exactly, and it, I can't tell you how long it took us to get to the point that we realized that you have to have all those layers. It took at least a year of uh, camera angles and note taking before we realized that that's really what supervision is. It's, it's looking at a tape of a tape and it's followed by, that's Ulema. Action. Okay, so um, we're gonna watch the rest of the video. Excuse us for that little pause. <laughs> uh, let's just see. They're listening to what the supervisor. Again, you're, you're coaching. You're providing positive reinforcement. You're prioritizing your feedback, and I see all that. Right. Which is like the role play. Yes. Role play. She's taking notes. And you mentioned next time, so that means that you've scheduled at this point a follow-up appointment mm -hmm. with Jason. So again, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven out of eight. Okay. So you are doing very, very well. Congratulations. Thank you you are almost there. You had a good day term. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, but so this is the only thing that we need to concentrate on and I think um, in, our, in your next feedback session with Jason, I know that you'll have an opportunity to do that okay. um, and then the feedback will be 100% on this competency. Oh, so yay, you're getting there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I will see you next time. Okay, thanks. Sure. So Dennis, this is, this is where I think the positive reinforcement comes in. It's got, it comes in at the grassroots level where somebody's working with somebody else 
to try to meet these supervision goals. So we have some pilot data. I'll leave you with this. So this is uh, percent correct performance during baseline. This is a, a supervisor engaging in supervision according to our 10 point list and the, sup the person's getting about five of the 10 items. Not a, about five, exactly five of the 10 items. There's some reliability checks. You can see they're fairly close. This is the impact of a Uber supervisor on the supervisor's performance. And you can see it doesn't take long. It took months to get to the point that we could actually do this first data point. But the first data point, the first jump, happened as a result of one supervision session. I'm convinced that you can get people to be good supervisors if it's really focused and really kind of intensive. And so anyway, you, you can tell there was a lot went into it because of uh, the checklists and everything that went into it. And it looks like it maintains. So this is, this is the beginning of um, the type of data that we need on, on training supervisors. We need, we need more of it. This is obviously this is just pilot work. Uh, we, f we feel pretty good about it. It's pretty reliable. Now this is the trainer. This is what happens. Now the supervisor uh, who was working with the trainer, this is what the trainer behavior looked like. You can see the trainer wasn't doing too good. There's the reliability checks. 100% uh, on those. The Uber supervisor comes in, shapes on the supervisor, and you can see it looks like an acquisition curve. Uh, so this is, this is one level removed. We shaped on the supervisor, and now we wanted to know what effect did this have on the supervisee. And you can see we're not there yet. We can only get up to about 80% of the behavior, but at least it's a kind of a start. Uh, and the next thing we're looking at, is, or what Ulema is looking at uh, is the uh, client data, and I hope to have that at some point. Changing supervisor behavior improves trainee performance. Thank you for coming. Looks like we're on time. Perfect. Thank you.